So I thought, um, as we think about some pitfalls in, in the service, I mean, that's one of the pitfalls of being physically aggressive, um, so we just be careful of that. But uh, other pitfalls um, is, uh, I thought to take the, the life of Saul, King Saul in the Old Testament, who uh, was utterly and categorically rejected by God. Okay, And Saul actually, um, sorry, I'll stop the recording, you can start again if you want. Um, Saul actually started really, really well. Okay, he was um, the 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 prize choice. So when it came to serving God, the people begged for a king, and then um, God said, "Fine, I'll give you a king." And He gave them not only someone that they wanted, but He also looked into the heart and chose someone who was very, very good. Okay, who was King Saul. He started very, very, very good. And he was someone that God could work with. But, unfortunately, over time, he was rejected completely. Okay? In, in no uncertain terms. So we're going to go through a little bit of what he did. To, to why, why did it get to the point where he got rejected by God like that? So what was Saul's mistake? Does anyone remember? What was Saul's mistake? What did he do wrong that made him get rejected? Yeah? Made an offering, yeah. More details? Incorrectly, yeah. How? Yeah, good. So he was meant to wait for Samuel. Samuel said, I'll be there in seven days. So just so we clear, what God accepts, this is the beginning of the story. The story is the man was humble. Okay? The man was humble. When he first started serving and God chose him, he said, uh, who am I that you're going to choose me, the smallest of the tribe of Benjamin, to be the king of Israel? And when they went to go anoint him as king, they said, where's Saul? Do you remember where he was? He was hiding amongst the equipment. I don't know what the equipment was, but he was amongst the equipment. So he, was, he wouldn't take the honor. Okay. Now you compare that to later in his life, it's a very different behavior. But at the beginning of his life, he was hidden, he was a very hard worker, and he was incredibly obedient. His dad said, go find the donkeys. He went find the donkeys. He was scared that his dad would be upset where he was. So he was hardworking. He was humble. He was obedient. So he started really, really good. Within one year, the Bible says when he had been serving for one year as king and two years, so it's very early in his kingship, he was at this battle. He's about to, and Samuel said, you wait for me seven days. And on the seventh day, I'll be there. We'll make a sacrifice. And then you go to war. So the people are putting pressure on him. Where's Samuel? Where's Samuel? They're getting anxious. So what does, what's Saul's reaction? He says, I'm, he just does the sacrifice. As he's finishing the sacrifice, um, Samuel arrives. As Samuel arrives, he says, what have you done? He said, the people put pressure on me. I had to. Okay? And so he starts to justify himself. So... I want to think about what led him there. What got him to the point where he decided on himself that he's going to act as if he's the priest and he's going to make the sacrifice. And then when he's confronted by that, he doesn't even recognize he's done anything wrong. What led him to that? And what's the first trap of service? Yeah, it's pride, but what got him? Why did he get proud? Yeah, but yeah. Huh? It was, yeah, but there's more. He was successful. He was successful. So because he was successful, he then thought, I can do whatever I want. I'm the king. I've, I've achieved these, these victories. i have the one who's done. So one of the big pitfalls of service actually is success in service. One of the traps of, of service is success. And the devil will get into my mind and say, look how successful you are. Look how good you are at service. How much better you are than everyone else around you. You can do whatever you want. Someone comes and uh, Amor Mani tells you to do this. Say, no, I don't have to listen to Amor Mani. Why? I know what I'm doing. I'm, the, the class is running very successfully. And that's exactly what happened. He thinks to himself, I did it. I will continue to do it. I'm the king. So one of the traps that leads to arrogance, and by the way, arrogance is the problem, is the, is the disease that comes with that, with success. And you might, by the way, you see in every field, if, if any of you are ever lucky enough or unlucky enough to work in a hospital, you can see genuine arrogance sometimes. It's genuine. It's deep. 
Like they really think, like, well, I remember one, um, he's a cardiologist, a heart specialist. And we would, he, he was doing the round and then someone came up to him, asked him a question. He said, listen, I'll talk to you after I go save this person's life. You know, and I, just, I, just, I, I, was, I was mortified. I was mortified at this behavior. I said, like, I just can't comprehend how you could behave that way. I shouldn't be judging, but, you know. Um, <laughs> but I thought, you, you'll see in every setting, by the way, that I'm going to save his life. I'm the one. That level of arrogance. And then it gets to the point where the person thinks they know what's best. They know what's best. I know what's best for the service. I will tell you what's right and what's wrong. And that's where Saul was. And later on, he does the same thing, by the way. But he says he knows what's best. And so it manifests in a few different things. When I fall into this trap, there's a few things how it can manifest in my behavior. Number one, I start to become disobedient or reluctant to obey. I don't want to obey. Why? Because I know better. I've been more successful. I know how to do it better than this person who's telling me what to do. So you've got to be careful of disobedience. Saul also, during that time, he made, he made this, this vow. He said, if anyone eats before the evening, they're going to get um, killed. Right? Before, before, we have, before we win this battle, if anyone eats, guess who was the person who ate? His son. So he made himself look like a fool. Because he was talking on behalf of God. You know, that sometimes we think, you know, I start to talk in a way as if I'm God. You know? That when my opinion is so important, it's one of the traps of the service. And I start to know what's best. I start to be a bit, um, uh, I use the Arabic expression, damned ill with the service. I know what's best, and if it's done not this way, then it's wrong. I start to talk in that style of language. Recently, I was listening to what the Pope was saying. He was talking to the, the Synod, and he was saying that that language is wrong. It's not right. That I'm going to be the hero of what's right and what's wrong. I will be the judge of what's right and what's wrong. You know, it's not proper language. It's not meant to be taken. You know, I, I, when I was first thinking about this talk, pitfalls, and uh, one of the things I, I was thinking is that sometimes one of the traps, one of the pitfalls of service is I take the service too lightly. Like I don't put enough effort in. I don't care enough. But the opposite of that is I take it too seriously. That if it's not done the way I want it done, then it's a disaster and I'm going to make a fight. And, and so many people have destroyed the service in trying to fight for the service that they're serving. So be careful. Okay? And unfortunately, success is one of the things that... I'm not saying we, we shouldn't be successful in the service. We want to be successful. We want God to bless us. But how we are successful is very important. Okay? So may God give us success, but may God not let success destroy us. Unfortunately, it does. Okay? So we'll be careful of that. The next, as we go through Saul's life, okay. The um, as you continue, Saul's next mistake. So his first mistake, we said, was making that sacrifice. The next, ah, the next was he um, uh, he's given a task by Samuel, and he says, "Go and." Take over the Amalekites. And when you take over, destroy everything. Nothing is to survive. The king is to die. The cattle is to die. Everything is to be burnt. Everything is gone. And so what does he do? What did he keep? Keep some animals. And he said, he'd, he, when he kept animals... He justified it. He wanted them, but he justified it by saying, oh, I'm going to sacrifice it to God. But what else did he do? He spared the, the king. And then Samuel came and said, Saul, you've been disobedient again. He said, no, I haven't. What are you talking about? We just, we just won the battle. Can't you see? And Samuel says, but what's this I hear in my ears? What did he hear? The bleeding of the sheep. He's saying, you, I told you to kill everything. You said you killed everything, but I can hear some sheep. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just kept that for the sacrifice for God. And then he kept the king as well. So as I said to you before, he starts to know what's right. He starts to think he knows better than God. God said, kill it. He says, no, I know better. It's better to keep the king as a prisoner. It's better to keep this stuff. And God said, no, I know what's right. And then he doesn't acknowledge his mistake. Okay, He does not at any point repent from his mistake. 
Just let's be clear on that. Then he says to Samuel, what does he say to Samuel? What's his response? And this is the next lesson, next pitfall. Okay, they have a special conversation and it shows what's in Saul's heart. What, is, what happens? Anyone know? No one knows the story that well. He says to Samuel, he says, Samuel, would you come with me? So at least, I know that I've been rejected. Because Samuel says, you've been rejected. He says, come with me so we can worship God. Why does he do that? And Samuel agrees. Samuel goes with him. But why? What's he trying to save? He's trying to save, he's trying to save face. He doesn't want to be embarrassed in front of the people. He says, at least don't humiliate me in front of the people. At least don't embarrass me in front of the people. And so what's the next pitfall, the next trap, the next problem that we can fall into when we serve God? Is our image. We care more about what people think of us than what God thinks about us. Okay? And that's a very important problem. Unfortunately, it's like it's something that is unfortunately a big part of the service. That when we care more about the way we are seen than the way we actually are. And that's hypocrisy. That's what Jesus rebukes as hypocrisy. The difference between Saul and David, one of the big differences between them, what led David to proper repentance and Saul not, is that Saul did not care how he looked in front of God. Saul only cared how he looked in front of people. David was quite happy to humiliate himself. So when David made a mistake... David humiliated himself in front of the people. He was on the floor. He looked like a mess. He wouldn't eat. He was begging God. He's the king. And they're saying, get up and eat. And he says, no, I'm not going to get up and eat. I'm going to wait because maybe God will give me mercy. When, he, when the Ark of the Covenant finally returned, David had this incident with God where he was scared of God and he was angry with God. And the Ark of the Covenant didn't come back to Israel. And then when the Ark finally came back, David was so happy. He danced. And, he, 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 and his wife looked at him and despised him because he humiliated himself in front of God. And he said, I don't care if I humiliate myself in front of God. Because he cared about what God thought about him. When we serve, we have to care about the way God sees us, not the way people see us. So I'm not worried about my success the way it looks like in front of other people. I'm not worried about how I look. I'm more worried about how does God see me. And when I'm worried about how God sees me, then... Um, then I do the right thing. I don't care that people embarrass me. I'll actually behave properly in the service. So um, be careful of that second trap that Saul fell into. He cared more about, and the way that um, the New Testament puts it is the, about the Pharisees, they cared more about the praise of men than the praise of God. And the same goes, by the way, when people compliment me. If I really know that I've committed sin, for example, it doesn't matter to me that people think that I'm wonderful when I know that God's that I've committed sin in front of God, and the, the vice versa is true that people abuse me, but I know that I'm honest in front of God. So hold on to that, and the second pitfall of the service that we don't care about the way people see us. It's not the purpose of the service. Of course, we have to keep um, our integrity in front of man. You know, God, when Samuel grew, he grew in favor with man and God. Jesus grew in favor of man and God. But that's through integrity, not by hypocrisy. There's a big difference. I'm not hiding anything. It's by my integrity that I grow in favor. So that's the second trap. Third thing, and the last one we'll talk about uh, that, that Saul did. So Saul's now being rejected completely. Okay, God has rejected him. He has no hope of returning. Or he does have... I'm sure that if he repented properly, God would have been lenient with him. But he didn't. At no point did Saul repent. Then there's this incident where David now, the, the, the bad spirit gets onto Saul and he's always distressed and angry and frustrated and all these things. And then um, David comes and he kills Goliath and David knows how to play the harp and David calms Saul down when, when Saul's angry. And so he's in this state. And David is actually bringing great success to Israel. Okay? The Israel of Saul. So this is Saul's Israel. David is bringing big success to Israel. And then there's this one incident where David has just come back from a nice campaign where he's, he's killed a lot of people on behalf of Saul. And the women are singing and they're dancing. Okay? And they're singing a particular song that makes Saul nuts. 
Does anyone remember what the singing that they sang? Yeah, so Saul, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. So they're attributing more to David than to Saul. Okay? And this makes Saul nuts. Okay, he can't handle it. What's the third trap? Yeah, envy. Uh, a spirit of competition. Spirit of competition. Like I'm looking around me at the success of others. And when I see other people successful, particularly in the service, it disturbs me. I have a spirit of envy and competition. And <clears throat> what then, what's the manifestation of that? So that one, you see the manifestation of this spirit of competition, that I want to be the top, is one, envy. I can become very disheartened. I can become very frustrated with the service. I don't want to continue. I'm not having the success I thought I would have. Other people are successful, so I just lose hope. But also, I refuse sometimes. I can refuse to be removed from my position. It's my position. You know, Abuna Paul always says this as a joke, but he says that sometimes Amber Abraham Church is like a series of dioceses. You know, everyone has a, a seat and they can't be removed from their seat. You know, you know, like the, the bishop on his seat. You know, <laughs> he's just joking, but what, what's he trying to say? You know, <laughs> what's he trying to say? He's trying to say that sometimes this disease, I'm the only one who can do the job. I'm the best. I can't have anyone do better than me. And it leads to this toxic attitude where I don't want to be removed from my service. It's mine. It's mine. It's my sense of ownership. Saul has shown that all the way throughout. He started meek. He started humble. How can I be the king? And then he grew into this monster that's trying to kill his own son. He's trying to kill his own son because David is going to take your spot. You know, he's, he's worried that David is going to take Jonathan's position Yet, he tries to kill Jonathan. makes no sense. It's irrational. He tries to kill David, of course, on multiple different occasions. And so, these are the traps set, uh, some of the, the, the traps we set in service. And, and I think the bottom line to all of them, as we progress through some of these, these problems, is the problem is, that's all about me. If you look at, through these problems that we saw, it's all about me. I did it. I can do it. How do people see me? Um, how come they're better than me? How come I'm not better than them? It's all competition. It's me. The, as long as I'm self-absorbed in me, then we can't have the glory of God. When the service is all for the glory of God, the whole purpose of the service is glory of God. And so I'll finish just by looking at David as, as the polar opposite of Saul. David, by the way, fell into these traps. David at one stage said, uh, let's do a census of the people. He wanted to measure his success. Okay, so I said the first trap was success. He said, let's do a census of the people, measure my success. He got punished for it, but he repented properly from it. He repented properly from it. It's not that he didn't fall into the trap. We all fall into these traps, by the way. You all will at some point fall into these traps in your life. But how do I come out of them? David, the difference why he's so acceptable is that David's focus point was always God. Every now and then he got lost in himself, but his focus point was always God. If you, you want to know what's in the heart of David, then you go open the Psalms. And you see that all throughout his life, he was focused on prayer. He'd write the Psalms. He wasn't just focused on his kingdom and his kingship. He had this internal journey that he was taking. When you're serving God, you have an internal journey that you're taking. And then the external sign is your service. But the internal journey is actually more important. And so David was sitting there, wrote, focused on the prayer, focused on the Psalms. He had this it's in this life that he had with God. So that when he made a mistake and he was confronted with his mistake, he repented of his mistake. He bowed down in front of God. He didn't defend himself. He didn't say, oh no, I didn't do anything wrong like Saul did. No, he accepted and then he repented. And so David's journey was focused on God. So even then, I said to you before, one of the, the, the problems is when you think uh, when it's about competition is that I can't have the service taken from me. Even David was willing to have his kingdom taken from him. When Absalom took it, he cared more about Absalom than his kingdom. He didn't care. He cared more about the person than the kingdom. God, of course, didn't allow it, but that's what he cared about more because his heart was in the right place. So 
may God protect us from some of these uh, issues that we can that can happen. And it's all about the internal battle that you fight, the internal journey that you take in your service. It's an internal journey. It is not external. The success of your service is not measured externally. It is absolutely not measured externally. It's an internal measure. That if you, and when you stand in front of God at the end of your life of service, when you commit your life to God in service, he will look at the virtue that you've built. He'll look at the prayer life, the intimacy you have with Him. He's not going to look at the data. Okay? He's not going to look at the bottom line. He's going to look at the journey that you took. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Thank you for listening. I know it's been a very long day for everyone, so um, I'm sure no one has any questions. If anyone has any questions, you can ask, but if you, you guys want to call it a day, then it's okay too. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a very important point, this idea of, of guilt and feeling bad. And even David, King David, was, was, he felt guilty and he lost his son because of his sin. But he didn't hold on to that guilt. He didn't hold on to it. He looked forward to the mercy of God. You know, when um, so many people, unfortunately, in our world don't know how to relieve themselves of guilt, this internal thing that's toxic inside them. And part of it is that I don't really believe in the power of God to forgive. And that's what um, St. Augustine says is the unforgivable sin, the idea that, you know, blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. That sin is considered the one that doesn't believe in the power of God to forgive. And the reason why it's so important that we believe in that is that one, it can't be forgiven unless I give it to God to forgive. Number two is that if God has forgiven something, it gives me the power to forgive myself because he's the ultimate authority, not me. It's not about me. It's not about me deciding how could I have made this mistake. That's when I'm, I'm self-obsessed. But when I recognize I'm weak and I can make mistakes and all humans can make mistakes, but God has let it go, then I can let it go. It's, it's, it's recognizing weakness but also recognizing the strength that comes from being in the presence of God. Alex and then Tamla. Oh, sorry. I said, um, you said uh, success, caring about the way people see me more than the way God sees me. And uh, the third is the spirit of competition. Even as a church, it's the, the idea of being competitive with other churches, there can be nothing more toxic than that to, to the life of a church. Um, which unfortunately, some of us will fall into that trap and we should never. Uh, yep. So, um, if the external life doesn't match with the internal journey, it's a work in progress. Okay, it doesn't mean I stop service. Okay, that's also another trap that people, like I said, you take it too seriously or too lightly or too lazy. I don't want to continue in the service. No, I continue working for God. I'm trying, but I'm working hard. At the the effort should be internal, not external. Once you put a lot of effort internally, the external effort comes easy. Once you realize that the real battle is inside, the external stuff becomes really simple. Because you're doing, it, you're doing it right. When the inside is not right, the external stuff becomes really, really hard. Because why am I, why am I going through this effort? Why am I dealing with this headache? Why are I, like, these parents complaining at me about, why am I dealing with it? It's not my problem. But when I realize I, I care about the souls of these kids, then I'll have the motivation to deal with the parent. It becomes very little effort for me. Very little effort for me to put effort because the internal is, is I'm working hard there. So the problem is I think sometimes we put too much effort externally sometimes and we burn out and we can't be bothered and I don't want to and it becomes meaningless. Whereas when I'm putting effort inside, then the external stuff becomes really simple because it actually is much easier work. A, a, a good way of thinking about it is parents with children. You know, when, when people first enter the workforce, when you guys all graduate, you're going to enter the workforce and you go, oh, so much work, nine to five work, it's so hard, it's a rigmarole of life, right? Then... You're going to hit real work, which is what? Kids. Yeah, you have kids. And guess what people do to escape their kids? They go to work. They go to work. Work becomes so easy. 
And it's like, oh, I work. And they look forward to it. And I want to wake up early. I'm going to turn up to work early so I don't have to do the morning routine with my kids. You know? And why? Because what people start to recognize is that the internal effort is harder than the external effort. It's much harder. And it's actually far more valuable. It's far more valuable. And when my home life is right, then my work life will be right. But if my home life is not right, I'm not saying it's good to leave your kids. I'm saying people do that. <laughs> we shouldn't do that. You know? But when your home life is right, then everything outside will be right as well. Because it's the starting point. It's the same with my heart. When I serve, if my heart is right, the internal effort is right, the prayer life is right, I'm working hard inside, then the external becomes much easier. It becomes actually a relief. You know, I, I remember once I said to um, the head of service, he's saying, do you pray for the kids and all this stuff? And, and he said, it's more valuable to pray for the kids than to even visit them. I said, okay, easy. I'm not going to visit the kids. Uh, in, and th- those two hours I would have gone out to visit and whatever. I, I actually would have been in their houses for, say, three visits, 20 minutes a pop, one hour. I'll pray instead. He goes, okay, do it. One hour of prayer each week just for the kids instead of visiting. I said, easy. All right, I'll do that instead. All right, I'm lazy, I don't have to go out, it's easy. And I couldn't do it. It's harder. It's much harder. So I'd rather go visit, get in my car, drive there, visit the kid, come home. Because the internal life is harder, but it's more important. It is more important. Uh, Tantamona, sorry, I didn't answer your question. What was your question? Yes, and, and, and what, what Tatmona is saying is very, very important. This idea that we're uplifting each other in front of the service. We're making the other look good. I'm here to support the sake of the other, not the other way around. And of course, the key to that, especially when my heart is a bit not right to the people around me, is the idea of prayer. Prayer has a power to soften the heart of people uh, towards each other. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, this is a confession. I was driving here near the church, and I got pulled over. And um, the guy pulled me over, and he put his... It was near Glen Quarry. <laughs> and so... Um, as, as he was pulling me over, I decided uh, instead of stopping in the middle of the road and blocking the traffic, I'll just turn into the car park. Anyway, he did his thing again as if I was doing something wrong. And then when, he st- when we stopped, he said, why didn't you stop when I told you? I, go, I, I don't know, I thought it was safer. I thought this was better. And he was really angry with me. He was like really damned to ear, like telling me off. I said, oh, look, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean it. And then he said, you know, I clocked you going 68 in a 60 zone. And I said, oh. Come on. Like, I didn't say that. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And, and, and I was, but I was a bit frustrated. I was a bit frustrated. And he was really being really like, like, Neshif, you know? And, and I said, okay. And he goes, oh, give me a minute. And he went to his car. And while he went, I was like frustrated. And then I said, you know what? Anyway, God, at least give him peace. If, if anything comes from my fine, at least let him be soft, calm. Um, and I thought, whatever, I've copped it. This, this, I'm not gonna get, I've never gotten away with it, by the way. I've never been pulled over, and they let me go. It's just never happened. Other people have stories of that, but not me. And then he came back, and his heart was, you know, he said, you know what? Like, I get that you were trying to stop for my safety in, in the car park. You know, I understand. I'm going to let you go with a warning. And he was just being so nice. I said, how did the person go from that to that, like that, in a second? I said, thank you, God, that you heard my prayer, you know, that you gave him peace in his heart. And if, if, if as, a, as a priest, I brought peace to this man by speeding, then let me speed more. <laughs> no, I, I'm just joking. But, but prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful when it's done right. I'm not praying against anyone. I'm praying for the people around me. I'm praying for my children. I'm praying the internal life is more important than everything you do externally, everything. So remember that and let that be the focus point of our service. Glory be to God forever. Amen.
Um, it's, not, it's not a show, we don't clap. Please.